Welcome to the Quincy Institute's panel titled Sanctioned Realities, Iran and the Failure of Economic Warfare. My name is Trita Parsi. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Quincy Institute, a transpartisan think tank in Washington that promotes ideas that move U.S. foreign policy away from endless war and toward uh, uh, prolonged and sustained diplomacy. We have tended to have a sanctions skeptical uh, approach uh, uh, at the Quincy Institute, which is part of the reason why it is a great pleasure for us today to talk about a book that looks at this issue at great depth and detailed. Sanctions have long been a staple in US foreign policy on the assumption that they're an effective alternative to war. But a new book by Nargis Bajokli, Vali Nas, Javad Saleh, Eswani, and Ali Baez titled How Sanctions Work, the Impact of Economic Warfare on Iran, demonstrate that punishing sanctions are not only often unsuccessful, but actually counterproductive. The case of Iran, which has undergone U.S. sanctions for over four decades, is instructive. Escalating U.S. sanctions has only furthered enmity between the United States and Iran, increasing the likelihood of lethal conflict and the prospect of a nuclear Iran at the same time, all the while compelling the Iranian population to pay the price for this economic punishment. At a time when the risk of a region-wide war in the Middle East is growing, and it is important to consider the extent to which economic warfare may have helped bring us to this point, and what does that then mean for U.S. foreign policy going forward? We're delighted to have with us today two of the authors of this new book, Nargis Bajokli and Valinas, who are co-directors of the Rethinking Iran Initiative at Johns Hopkins SAIS, to discuss the arguments and the evidence that they have unearthed uh, in this new book in greater detail. For those of you who are joining us via Zoom, you can use the Q&A function to ask your question. I'm trying to get to those throughout our conversation. And if you're watching it through Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, you can use the comment section to ask your questions and we'll try to get to those as well. So without any further ado, let me introduce our excellent panelists. Nargis Bojokli is an assistant professor of Middle East studies at Johns Hopkins SAIS. She's an award-winning anthropologist, scholar, and filmmaker. Her book, Iran Reframed, Anxieties of Power in the Islamic Republic, received the 2020 Margaret Mead Award, the 2020 Choice Award of Outstanding Academic Title, and the 2021 Silver Medal in Independent Publisher Book Award. So clearly a book that everyone here has to pick up and read. Vali Nasser is Professor of International Affairs at Johns Hopkins Science and also served as its Dean uh, from 2012 to 2019. He's the author of several books on the Middle East and he served in the Obama administration as a senior advisor to Ambassador Richard Holbrook. Both Vali and Nargis are widely recognized as two of the foremost experts on Iran in the United States. So let's get started. Let me ask you the first uh, question to both of you. Um, the topic of sanctions and their lack of political successfulness in terms of being able to change the policies of the country that the U.S. is sanctioning is quite well established in academic circles. Plenty of studies have been done that show that the rate of successfulness is far below anything that could be considered useful. Yet, it does not seem to have translated into any awareness or consideration of that reality in Washington. Sanctions continue to be a tremendously popular, if not increasingly popular, uh, tool in Washington, despite clear evidence uh, in the academic circles of its many, many flaws and problems. What prompted you, you four, to write this book uh, about sanctions, given how difficult it has been to penetrate Washington's thinking about sanctions? And how do you think or hope that what you have unearthed in this book will help change that reality? Nargis, why don't we start off with you? Sure, first of all, thank you so much for having us and thank you for everyone who's a part of this conversation today. Um, that's a great question, Trita. And I think I would start uh, answering that by saying that, um, first of all, a lot of that academic um, 
uh, research, which is an really incredible and really important, it's not being necessarily read by the policy community. Um, so there was a problem of translation here between different communities. Um, second is the fact that a lot of the academic research um, is also being done in um, either uh, not as sustained ways across different parts of the populations that are being sanctioned, but also mm. importantly, um, they're being done in such a way that uh, it's still maintaining the, the, the uh, arguments about what sanctions do in a very abstract sense. And so what we were trying to do here is to bring together a comprehensive study looking at the impact of sanctions, not only economically, which has been done in other countries, including Iran, but also looking at it um, from the perspective of different members of uh, different sectors of society, uh, both mm. those who benefit from sanctions including those connected to the IRGC or the Supreme Leader's offices and businesses affiliated with them, as well as those who are uh, affected in, in adverse ways in, throughout the population. And we wanted to bring in the perspective of um, civil society activists in Iran and look at really on the ground what is happening and how do sanctions uh, refract in the very everydayness of a society. So this is... Mm. Um, Part of we, we wanted to sort of offer a comprehensive analysis and to do so in a language that brings it down to the human level, because sanctions are um, both the ways in which they are written and the ways that they are talked about. Um, very abstract, very legal. They take the human experience out of the whole thing. Um, but really sanctions are when imposed and especially in the long duration of a country like Iran, but comprehensively regardless, they have severe ramifications throughout society. And the question often asked in policy circles of do sanctions work, we argue is actually the wrong question to ask because sanctions work, they do work in society. But do they work in the ways that they're intended to is the bigger question. And then the only way that we think you can answer that is by looking at it from every possible angle um, that this research allows us to do. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Vali. Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, I, I mean, when you read this book, uh, it, it's a book that uh, crosses academics and policymaking, or let's say academics and, and broader public. And we did that deliberately. Now, for those who are much more interested in, in uh, academic probing, uh, this book was based on a project that uh, Rethinking Iran and, and Nargis led, which uh, 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 brought together a group of social scientists to work on all aspects of sanctions based on field data, its impact on healthcare, education, politics, economics, and, and all of those papers are actually available on Rethinking Iran's uh, website. But we decided to bring this together uh, both to actually inform the academic community. I mean, there, there are two academic uh, community audiences here. One is the study of Iran and Iranian studies, which, we, you know, there is a lot written on the nature of the Islamic Republic, the nature of the social opposition to it, the nature of Iran's economy, its foreign policy. But it's actually divorced from the two-ton elephant in the room, which is what the, this pervasive presence of sanctions over four decades has done to Iran. Uh, and in a way, this book looks, uh, not to say that it's a, it, it's completely ignores all of that, but, but looks at what's happened to, to, to Iran through the angle of sanctions rather than through the angle of ideology of the Islamic Republic or the character mm. of its leaders, et cetera, which mm. we think adds a new dimension to the study of Iran. Mm. Secondly, many of the academic studies that have been on, done on sanctions are still divorced from the most important sanctions case before us which is the case of Iran, the country that until Russia's invasion of Ukraine was the most sustained and most sustained sanctioned country and the most sanctioned country in, in history. And, uh, and there are aspects to Iran's the case, both at the micro level of data on society and economy, as, as Nargis mentioned, or as our co-author co Javad Sali Esfani has, has dug up, but also at the much more macro level, in other words, uh, you know, how does Iran actually survive under sanctions? Why is it becoming more aggressive on sanctions? How does it calculate against sanctions? And one of the issues that, that um, is important in the case of Iran is not that sanctions don't work, which is what academics, as you mentioned, have concluded, but why sanctions actually has the exact opposite effect that of the intention. And that's a sort mm. of, a, it has to be an area of research. Mm. And for policymakers, mm. of course, you know, uh, 
it's difficult necessarily to change Washington's opinion. But throwing in the towel definitely is not the way to do it, which is that you still have to co confront the, all these assumptions and, and, and arguments that are put out there with, with data. I mean, during the height of the protests last year, the very people who are asking for democracy in Iran and, and freedom in Iran were also advocating for sanctions, targeted sanctions, more sanctions, don't lift sanctions, without connecting that actually what they're arguing in terms of sanctions undermines what they wish for Iran. And, 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 and unless you present this to the debate, uh, you're not going to change minds. And again, you know, we're not challenging necessarily the, the sort of abstract idea of sanctions. We're basically telling American foreign policymakers that if you really want Iran to change, then you're actually having the counterproductive effect. And maybe it's time for the United States to stop and pause and think uh, that, you know, if its goal is for Iran to come to the nuclear table, not get involved in Lebanon, in Gaza, to, to you know, normalize, uh, uh, are you actually uh, uh, producing results over there? And, 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 and our argument in this book, which is counterintuitive, is that it's actually the opposite. The sanctions mm -hmm. have made Iran more aggressive, more nuclear, more dictatorial at home. On every indices that sanctions were supposed to work, it's had the opposite effect. Mm -hmm. I want to get into almost every one of those aspects uh, on the policy side. But as Nargis mentioned earlier on, one of the I would say amazing contributions of this book is the extensive interviews you have all done with people on the ground and giving the human angle and dimension to it, which I agree fully has been largely missing in much of the sanctions literature. Otherwise, I want to read um, a passage. It's actually in the very beginning of the book uh, from one person in, in Iran. Uh, it, it reads, I'm a 44 year old woman who has lived 41 years of her life on the varying degrees of economic sanctions, said Habib Jafarian, a writer and an editor, writing nearly two years into the US maximum pressure sanctions on Iran. I grew up with the sanctions. I went to school with them. I learned to read and write with them hovering over my head. I fell in love. I began my career as a journalist and have stayed alive all under sanctions from the United States of America. Sanctions have been a part of my life like the weather. There's so much to unpack in this um, uh, in this paragraph there. On the one hand is the fact that sanctions tend to become permanent, that lifting of sanctions is so tremendously difficult, and that as a result, uh, the populations who end up becoming under sanctions end up becoming under sanctions for the entire life, and they adjust their lives to it. Can you, and there's other things of this that is, is so tremendously important because he also shows who is actually really suffering from these sanctions. But can you tell me a little bit more about what the testimonies from inside the country has been and how people have had to adjust their lives to sanctions and what that has done to their psychological uh, view and political perspective of what the point of the sanctions are um, uh, in the sense of, are they there to help them against a very unpopular regime? Or how do they end up seeing the sanctions when it's becoming a part of their life, like the weather? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So the, the you know, because again, we had been working on sanctions for a few years before we decided to write this book. And what we kept, kept coming up against was the fact that no matter how much you read about it, sanctions always remained abstract. And as and when something remains abstract, it's difficult to have language about it that allows us to understand it. And when we don't have language to really understand something, then we can't even begin to grapple with it and debate it and critique it. And part of the part of that requires us to understand and actually see what sanctions do. Um, when uh, I began reading more and more and talking with more folks who uh, are policymakers of making sanctions in the United States and in Europe and read their work, one of the things I realized was that they actually say that not the, the sanctions being invisible is a power to, to sanctions as a, as a foreign policy tool. And 
our decision became then, okay, we need to take people inside Iran and we need to, we need to visualize for them uh, what is going on. And the way that you do that is through very long form uh, oral histories. And so uh, I spent um, years sort of building off of my previous work and um, looking at the ways in which sanctions affected both those tied to the IRGC and businesses with them, as well as activists and civil society workers, as well as regular people just trying to get by who are not involved in the in the political or active spaces. And part of what we were trying to do is because, you know, it's really difficult as social scientists to say that sanctions cause X. That, that, that kind of causal argument is a difficult one, especially when it's spanned out over many years and that there are multiple factors at play to be able to explain what is going on. But one of the ways that you can get at it is through looking at people's trajectories over long periods of time and then seeing how how what is going on in their lives is mapping on to the various types of sanctions that Iran goes mm-hmm. under. The, the point of maximum pressure sanctions became a really important one because it was implemented in such a severe way that it allowed for us to be able to see some of these shocks that it made in society and then map it onto people's uh, you know, interviews and what they were telling us about what was going on in their lives. So part of what, what, uh, what we're seeing and, and from that passage that you bring out is that Iranians have, have learned that sanctions are sticky and they're not coming off. Um, mm-hmm. It's been a part of their lives, like, like you read, like, like the weather. And so, what that has turned into is for those folks who have attempted to create ground in Iran and actually create discursive space and material space to push for changes, whether um, in order to, for, to have diplomacy with the West or in order to be able to make uh, domestic changes to their to their government, um, all of those folks, no matter who I talked to, said to me, it feels like we are in a boxing ring and we're being hit by two sides, by both the hardliners within Iran and we're being hit by U.S. sanctions over and over again. And, and what I found most drastically, I think one of the findings that I didn't expect as much um, was how much as uh, civic society participants and activists have either well, ended up in prison or have retreated from from activism and from their involvement in the civic sphere because it has become so incredibly dangerous because not only, as Vadi said, does uh, a sanctioned state uh, go on the offensive and and become more aggressive uh, on the foreign policy and geopolitical space, but it sees its internal population over time as more and more of its enemy. And it because sanctions is not only just economic warfare, it is media warfare, it is psyops, it is cyber warfare, it is comprehensive. And, and when a state comes under that kind of comprehensive pressure, it it reacts as if it is in an existential crisis. And that reaction is not just external, it is also internal. And that has had severe consequences for activists, but then it has also meant that in order to break uh, to bust sanctions, um, there's a, a lot of uh, corruption that happens. And that kind of money is coming into the hands of uh, uh, business people who are tied to the uh, um, to the regime in some capacity, and so their wealth has mushroomed while everyone else has decreased. Mm-hmm. That, that's an excellent point. I'm going to get a little bit deeper into that particular angle of how it has strengthened um, some of the elements inside the country that the U.S. otherwise defines as being most problematic uh, from a U.S. standpoint. But you mentioned earlier on also that there have been voices favoring sanctions. I think value mentioned that there have been voices favoring sanctions in order to defeat the regime. Um, but based on your interviews, et cetera, how much of those voices were actually coming from people inside Iran, the activists inside Iran? And how much was that as coming from elements outside the country who are not the primary um, um, uh, folks suffering from the pain of the sanctions since they are not inside the country? And I guess you should answer that since you've done all the interviews. Um, so I would say that um, for the, I mean, the only time I began to hear from activists on the inside that Iran should be sanctioned more was uh, at a certain point in the midpoint of the Masa Amini uprisings. And I, I think that that is, it was a very understandable um, sort of set of 
grievances that I, that I heard over that time period, ever since um, those uprisings. And the, and then I think the understanding by a lot of folks that the reason why those very real grievances and that outpouring of rage did not turn into something more sustained and long-term was actually because, for example, their parents or folks around them could not join them in strikes or could not join them in protests because they, they now are under such uh, economic constraints that they need to be able to go to work. They need to be able to bring money at uh, home um, at the end of the day. And so it began to, I think, deepen the understanding even internally of what sanctions are doing. And then one of the things that we're beginning to see now too, is that there is a reconsideration of this idea of who is it that sanctions are actually benefiting? Because it's not I think one of the other things that we have to talk very critically about and we try to point to in the book is that it's not that sanctions harm everybody. Sanctions are actually beneficial to segments of society within a targeted system that allows those segments to, to have a monopoly after a while on wealth and a monopoly on power. And so there are also vested interests within targeted societies that are benefiting from sanctions. Um, and that is something that is becoming more and more apparent within Iran. The conversations I'm having lately are about uh, folks saying there are so many skyscrapers going up in Tehran. There's so many luxury malls that are being built. Well, why is that happening? That's happening because um, sanctions push trade onto the black markets. It, it uh, Bribes go up, corruption goes up, money needs to be washed within the country. It, it's happening through these high rise luxury buildings in luxury malls. Meanwhile, the folks who were in the middle class are becoming poorer and poorer by the day. And now sanctions for folks is in the material mm -hmm. in their material world. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, you are using a term in the title that some may find a bit provocative. You're calling it economic warfare. Uh, and I think particularly in Washington, where by and large, the perception is that actually this is the opposite of warfare. This is the alternative to warfare. Uh, we're doing this precisely because of our humanity. We don't want to go to war. We don't want to fire bullets. So we're doing this because it saves life rather than actually uh, uh, causing suffering. But if one were to accept that this is economic warfare, what are the implications of it? Are, are you suggesting that the use of this tool, if it is economic warfare, justifies a military response by a sanctioned country um, uh, because this is warfare? What are the implications, in your view, of using the term economic warfare? I mean, uh, let me ask that. I mean, first of all, uh, uh, we don't get to choose how the other side interprets uh, uh, our actions. I mean, uh, and, and, and although there are there are uh, uh, policymakers who actually have referred to this as 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 economic as, as with the terminology of warfare. I mean, warfare it just doesn't mean using bullets. It means using coercive measures to force another country to to basically bend to your bend to your will, either change their behavior, give up territory, change its regime. So you can either do that by, by, by varieties of forms of, of, of pressure. And countries essentially view warfare as, as a threat to their security. And, and we, want, we might want to parse this, that this is economic, that one is military. But in the eyes of Iran, the United States is out there to, to overthrow its regime, to undo its revolution, to force it out of the region, to to min to reduce its power, all, all of these things, and 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 yes, we may say that's justifiable because this regime has behavior and ideology that is that is not acceptable. But but the regime is still there, and that's that's basically the recipient uh, of this, and and therefore for them, the, they will combat this uh, in the best way that they see uh, uh, and beneficial to them, like. They would build a nuclear program to force the United States to negotiate over sanctions. They become involved in aggressive behavior in the region in order to uh, force the United States back. They insist on controlling Iraq in order to have uh, outlets for, for uh, Iran's economy. They, mm -hmm. they invest in networks of economic, military, security relations 
in order to be able to punch holes into in, in, into these activities. They decide that they should supply you know, Russia with ballistic missiles or drones in the middle of this war because it, it benefits them in terms of creating a Eurasian trade network that 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 would help them. So, uh, and then if you will look at it historically, uh, you know, uh, uh, Japan, when it defended itself after World War II of why it had attacked Pearl Harbor, it basically said that the Dutch and American uh, blockade of sale of oil to Japan, you know, the sanctions that were put on Japan warranted self-defense. And the attack on Pearl Harbor was self-defense. Of course, this argument is not acceptable to Americans, and it was not after World War II, but the Japanese clearly saw the economic blockade as warfare, and the response to it was military. So, uh, you know, the United States may think it's not waging war on Iran, but in the eyes of Iranians, starving its population, uh, d- deliberately reducing uh, the level of the country's wealth, uh, uh, trying to crush its institutions, to bring down its regime, uh, is, is, is to them is warfare. It's something that a country would do with bullets. When, when Secretary Pompeo says, you know, the Iranian regime has to d- decide whether it wants to feed its people or, or basically do what we ask it to do, uh, you know, to them, uh, it's no different than if this was a military tool. So, mm-hmm. so just because we're self-satisfied with this, with the fact that this is not warfare, this is cheaper on us. We don't send soldiers. Uh, it doesn't mean that that the other side doesn't see it as warfare. And then on top of that, you have literature and studies that show that contrary to Washington's uh, assumption that this is an alternative to war, it actually increases the likelihood of the use of military force. So David Lexian and Christopher Sprecher had a study in 2007 when which they looked at a very large number of uh, sanctions cases and studied as to whether it truly ended up being an alternative to war, but pointed to it actually dramatically increasing the likelihood of the use of force, particularly when, you cannot, uh, when democracies impose sanctions, which is most of the countries that do so, because of a failure of the signaling effort. You know, you bind yourself to a certain measure. You cannot walk it back because of political pressure from home. So your only option is to escalate further and eventually it leads to use of force. Uh, that uh, process that they describe, uh, which is that you essentially get stuck in a cycle of escalatory steps that eventually leads to some use of force. In the case of US-Iran, it never led to a full-blown war. But do you see evidence of that also having played out between the US and Iran, given the very, very extensive use of sanctions and how political US-Iran relations is on the US side as well as on the Iranian side? I, I would just give a quick question and let uh, uh, Nagas have perspective also from within. You know, it actually, we came extremely close to it. The fact that it didn't happen was by basically by, by, by hair. In other words, uh, maximum pressure led to much more aggressive uh, uh, Iranian activity uh, 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 in the in the Gulf, in 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 Iraq, etc. I mean, one reason, as 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 uh, Nargis said, is that once the country is in a state of war or sees it say in, in a state of siege, the people who gather around the decision making table tend to be the hawks on that side. Uh, I mean, people who talk about engagement, et cetera, diplomatic path, they, they basically get pushed aside. So Iran, you know, attacked Abqair in Saudi Arabia, downed an American drone, which, uh, you know, almost brought an attack on Iran and President Trump last minute, decided against it. It led to a crisis in Iraq after an American was killed. And then there was a siege of the American embassy in Iraq. And then it led to the killing of Soleimani. And the killing of Soleimani, there was 48 hours after that, that almost the two countries went to war. In other words, the Iranians reacted to the killing of Soleimani with a with the lo- single largest barrage of missiles to hit U.S. troops ever. And the United States may very well have reacted to that just because of the audacity of that act or because somebody might have been killed in Iraq. And in fact, the Iranians were expecting it. And that's why they led to the circumstances where they shot down a Ukrainian airliner uh, over their own country. They were that trigger happy. 
So, and there was a 48 hour period where uh, there was back channel efforts to defuse the situation, but the two countries came very close to war. And then recently again, when three Americans were killed in an, in an attack in Jordan, there were calls in this country to actually you know, go directly after Iran. And, 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 and the Gaza war, Iran's behavior in it, Iran's response to it is also happening in the context of where Iran and the United States sit. In other words, uh, you know, since President Trump imposed maximum pressure, Iran is still under maximum pressure. And Iran's reacting to maximum pressure. And, and Iran and the United States are never too far right now from, from getting into a war. So just because it hasn't happened right now, it doesn't mean that we may not end up in mm. a war between U.S. and Iran or, or U.S. and Iran's proxies in the region in the next month, as we're speaking. Or that, uh, and, and also how close they came actually is proof of the fact that, that post-maximum pressure, the likelihood of war between U.S. and Iran went drastically higher than it was the case before. Mm -hmm. Let's... Um... Let me ask a hypothetical, a counterfactual, perhaps is the right word. Back in 1995, when the U.S. first, 94, 95, when the U.S. first was uh, considering broad-based economic sanctions on Iran, even during the 1980s, while there were old sanctions, etc., there was actually trade uh, on goods uh, at the level of $4 billion a year. But 94, 95, that's when it really changed, and you had a couple of executive orders the debate in the country here was very interesting. One of the core arguments against sanctioning Iran at the time was that if the United States sanctions Iran, eventually this will lead to a scenario in which we will push Iran into the orbit of Russia and China. 30 years later, it seems that that argument has proven quite true. So I would like to ask both of you a, a, a counterfactual. You, Valley, Tell us where you think U.S.-Iran relations and Iran's foreign policy would be if we had not gone down that path back in the 1990s. Uh, or to make it a little bit more a brief, perhaps, uh, or a shorter time period, if we hadn't gone out of the JCPOA under Trump, would Iran be supporting Russia in Ukraine today? And of you, Narges, what do you think would have happened to Iran's society internally if it had not been put under those sanctions already 30 years ago, where would civil society in Iran potentially have been able to take the country in terms of their efforts to push for greater openness, democratization? You want to start off, Nargis? Sure. Um, so part of what we argue in the book and part of what we try to show is that the we're dealing with a revolutionary system and society here that was founded on a um a, a rhetoric and a outlook that was anti-american and anti-imperialist in the region so then therefore those who wanted to push for engagement those who wanted to push for a different kind of politics whether internally for reform and externally for engagement of some sort they had to actually make the space within society to be able to to do that. They had to create the space to have those conversations. They had to create the, the ability to have that language be out there very publicly in, in an environment where the where the the entire sort of apparatus and the entire understanding and discourse of the country had become one of confrontation from 79 onwards. And then we have all of the years of the war and the type of rhetoric that that produced. So when you get to 94, 95 in the mid 1990s, this is when you begin to see that the, 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 the children born in the 1980s, those who uh, had uh, wanted to have a different kind of uh, politics moving forward, those who had either fought in, or you know struggled in 79 for a revolution, but wanted something different. Not, the mid 90s is when they begin to hit the stage as far as the social stage, as far as the political stage, and it's where they begin to make pushes and are really attempting to create something different. Um, this is when you have all of the new uh, uh, newspapers that begin later on a couple of years after that coming out. And so what happens when sanctions are imposed 
And when sanctions sort of the, the, the durée of it, part of what we show in, in the book, uh, and we really attempt to show how this happens within the political structure of, this, of the system, is that the more that sanctions increase, the more that they come on or, or tensions uh, get harder, anytime there's any kind of uh, attempt at outreach, whether folks on the other side think that this is genuine or not. Right now, my concern is not about that. I'm talking about what's happening on an internal level. Mm -hmm. There has to be a momentum made internally for the discourse to even shift. I mean, look at this conversation we're having here in the United States, right? Part of the reason we're having this conversation and you started out the conversation you did, Trita, on sanctions is because the, the window of debate on sanctions has been so difficult to budge, even though you started out the conversation saying there's all this academic knowledge that shows this and that. Why are we still having this conversation in a mainstream environment that doesn't want to see this? Well, we ha that exists in, in a space like Iran, too, when it came to any kind of engagement with the outside. So then when the, the, the ground is won and then sanctions keep coming onto that, the other side that does not want the engagement says and, and wags their fingers and say, see, we told you so. See, we told you so that you can't trust the Americans. See, we told you so the West is going to come back on its agreements. And then with the JCPOA, what ends up happening almost completely once maximum pressure sanctions come in is a complete domination by the by the sector of the political spectrum that did not want engagement with the West and said that you cannot trust them because we see from their perspective, they say we see what is happening in the region militarily. And then therefore, we don't we don't think that what they're saying diplomatically is truthful either. So folks say, no, 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 we have to trust them. Maximum pressure comes in. And then therefore, that entire side of the political spectrum gets pushed out, not only electorally, but completely discursively. That conversation mm. is done with. Right. Mm. So then that creates new realities for what is even allowed to be discussed, where people have to begin to push from again. And that has ripple effects all in, in, in various ways throughout. So I would say one of the biggest things of that, that I saw looking at this in, in these decades was a hardening of the political culture and a hardening mm. of the political language. And this idea that um, because multi maximum pressure sanctions are a form of shadow warfare, mm -hmm. they're economic war, but also around the, the entire thing that is happening is cyber operations, psyops operations, media wars, and it's going in multiple directions, right? Iran is not just sitting there and it, 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 this is happening from multiple directions. So then... Um, what that means is that the out the political outlook of the Islamic Republic becomes one that is dominated by the Quds forces, which are the IRGC's extraterritorial forces and the IRGC's intel forces. So then they come that kind of outlook, which is they call it the battlefield mentality. The battlefield mentality then comes and dominates the entire political systems outlook on what is happening mm. internally and externally. And mm. that is a process that takes time. But when you track it out, it moves along with the severity of the sanctions. Mm. Very interesting. Do you see a similar development on foreign policy, Lali, the battleground mentality? Uh, and where, if, if we didn't have that mentality, where do you think Iran's foreign policy would be today? Uh, absolutely, and I and I would just sort of say that uh, just to build on what what uh, Nargis said. I mean, for every country, you have to say, you know, its decision makers say, is is the is the strategy or a foreign policy working? Is it serving national interest as, as it's interpreted by the people of that country, by the leadership of that country? Not 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 that the leadership we we imagine they should have, but the existing leadership. And if uh, in the nineteen nineties, President. Uh, uh, Raf Sanjani or then President Khatami and later in, in, in the 2010s, President Rouhani basically say that, that you know, engagement would solve Iran's problems, would put it, the country on a better uh, uh, healing, would, would reduce tensions, would protect its sovereignties. And if, and, and if they face increased sanctions, you know, as they're not rewarded by the West for thinking in that way, then basically the, their whole foreign policy theory is seen as having failed. That's mm -hmm. when the battleground mentality, not, not only that it is caused by the sanctions, but also the people who are behind it argue that, well, you know, your, your whole theory was wrong and, and you're, not, you're not going to protect our national interest. There has to be a different theory. 
Secondly, I would say that um, you know the periods that are that that you are that you are referring to, particularly under Rafsanjani in the nineteen ninety five time period, and then under Rouhani, you had really seriously influential and powerful advocates for engagement, and that that's a time that had the United States adopted a different strategy. Uh, had Trump not come out, come out of JCPA, had Clinton not responded to Rafsanjani with more and more sanctions, that potentially they had the ability to move this ball forward much mm. more. And let's say, what's the consequence? Uh, you know, just like Nagy said in, in, in answer to previous um, question, that sanctions creates a, a wealthy economic class, which we now see in Iran whose economic interests are now tied with the sanctions economy. When you have trade with the West, you create a wealthy economic class whose economic interests are tied with trade with the outside. And that class over time becomes the force of change, right? It's not immediate. It's not going to happen overnight. I, I give you one statistic. That, so before embarking on JCPOA, when he first became president just before, Rouhani basically had done it, had a group do a study that if JCPOA was to, sorry, did it actually, actually uh, during and after the, uh, they knew the results of the deal, that if JCPOA had survived for a period of 10 years and had been implemented, that the size of Iran's middle class would expand by 35%. And, and, this, and, and that this expanded middle classes economic wealth would be anchored in trade with Europe, even if not with the United States and trade with the world. He and his coterie and a lot of even secular intellectuals that were supported him in Iran or, or saw a promise in JCPOA believed that that would be the force of change. In other words, the size of the Iranian vote bank that would vote for change in Iran would become bigger and bigger. And, 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 and instead, maximum pressure has pushed 20% of Iran's middle class under the poverty belt. Now, for people who say, what's the alternative to sanctions? I think this is the alternative to sanctions. You don't want to go to war. Sanctions are not a solution. What you want is actually to, to, to expand the size of the society that wants change, make it independent of state control, anchor it in relationship with the West, and then see that changing. And we've seen it worked in Iran. Iranians voted for Rouhani twice with extraordinary numbers. They voted for Khatami. Uh, you know, in other words, uh, uh, you know, when, they, when that middle class was there and was expanding, it could be a force for change. And, and had, had the United States made different decisions in 1995 and in 2018, uh, you know, we would be in a very different place. Interesting. Thank you so much, Valik. We have uh, several excellent questions from uh, the audience. And one I think that is very relevant to this specific angle on the foreign policy is from Greg Lane, who has extensive experience with Iran, having served in the uh, CIA um, and worked on these issues. He asked that, well, if one of the metrics, at least, or um, is to make sure that the sanctions push back Iran's nuclear program. Um, isn't there an argument to say that at least on that count, uh, sanctions may not have overthrown the government, but hasn't it been successful um, uh, in terms of what it's done on the nuclear front? And if it's not pushing back the program, the argument that Greg is not necessarily making here, but you otherwise hear very often, sanctions were useful for getting Iran to the negotiating table. How would you answer that, Bali? Uh, first, to the same one, yes, yes, uh, they were they were successful in bringing Iran to the negotiating table. But but the problem is not uh, is not that uh, whether sanctions can compel countries to talk to you. The question is that if you can't or won't lift sanctions, those talks won't go anywhere, right? Uh, in other words, once the United States reimposed uh, sanction maximum pressure. Iran's program is now bigger than it was in 2015. Even if we went back to full compliance to JCPOA, the breakout time period is not going to be two years anymore. At best, it's going to be six months. So sanctions has not actually pushed back against Iran's program. It has expanded it. Iran's program has grown bigger and bigger as the U.S. has increased sanctions. 
In 20, 2006, when Iran first negotiated with the U.S. and had only 119,000 centrifuges and, and the United States dismissed it, put more sanctions on it along the way, Iran's program grew to 119,000 centrifuges. And then when the United States came out of uh, JCPOA, the, the, the program has e e expanded even further. So, so, I mean, it goes to a, bit, a larger point that uh, needs to be addressed. One is we have to decide what is the purpose of sanction. Are they just punitive? Are they for regime change? Or are, do they have a very specific goal in mind, which is, let's say, Russia needs to get out of Ukraine or Iran needs to end its nuclear program? But are you actually able to use not sanctions in position, but sanctions lifting as an efficacious way to achieve that? And there the United States has, 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 has failed miserably. So countries have now come to the conclusion and Iran after 2018. So there's no point going back to 2015 it, as, it, as if maximum pressure and America's double dealing on, has not happened. That's part of this experience is that if you, is that uh, Iranians and now probably Russians, others are looking at the same thing, have come to the conclusions that the United States would never lift these sanctions. And the only way that you may slow the sanctions is actually if your program also becomes bigger. So let's not forget that President Biden concluded that 60 percent, sorry, that uh, maximum pressure was just fine when he came in. It's actually not true that he wanted to go back into JCPOA. That was kind of Iran first has to go in, do everything, and then I'll decide what I want to do. And. The Iranians saw that maximum pressure is not moving. The United States basically following on Trump's footsteps. So they went to 60%. It's only then that the U.S. talked to them. And then they went to 84%. That's only then that the United States agreed to a you know, calm for calm policy in, in, in Oman before October 7th. So, so the Iranians have learned that actually to, to manage sanctions, you don't need to, you, you, you're not going to get anything from the United States by behaving, by reducing your centrifuges. You're only going to get a response from the United States by becoming bigger and more menacing. And, so, and it's in that sense that sanctions have been completely counterproductive. So we today see an Iran that is far more dangerous in terms of its nuclear program than it was in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, very interesting. And uh, in terms of what you mentioned, you know, let's decide what actual purpose the intent is. We have a good question from Stuart Kaplan on this that I want to get back to um, uh, in a second. But I, I, just very quickly, if uh, you all could respond both on the foreign policy front, but also on the internal front. So what lessons to be learned then from the Iranian case when it comes to Russia? If these sanctions have, on the one hand, radicalized Iran's society, strengthen the most hardline elements internally in Iran, uh, radicalize and embolden its foreign policy externally, as powerful of, as a player as Iran is in the Middle East context, Russia is a major power. How do you see this potentially playing out in the Russian case, both again internally and on their foreign policy? Now, I guess you want to start? Sure. Um, I would say that um... There, I, what we are seeing, so after we finished this book, we began a whole other series of research projects here at SICE that looks at sanctions in different sanctioned countries around the world. And pretty much so far, we are seeing the same patterns that we've seen in Iran, we are seeing in different sanctioned countries. And whether, again, those sanctions are comprehensive, like the Iran ones are, or different, even if targeted sanctions end up having similar kinds of um, of, of outcomes, and, and I'm happy to talk about that later. But I would, um, without being a Russia expert, what I'm seeing from my colleagues who are doing this kinds of work at the moment, and then they will be writing it up and, and publishing it, is that the same similar patterns are, are under play. The state becomes much more because, again, it sees it, it as itself in, in, a, in, in an increased uh, uh, war-like situation. So therefore, the same things that we see in societies that are under war, and Russia is actually in, in a war itself, in addition to the sanctions, is that a hardening of the political class, a increased and, and even more suppression of what is going on internally. Um, and then the other thing that I would just add to the conversation is that, uh, and this is what we point to in the book as well, is that as bigger and bigger economies get sanctioned, more and more infrastructure 
gets built to make trade happen away from the dollar. And so that does not mean that de-dollarization is coming tomorrow or next year or anything like that. But the reality is, is that more and more sanctions, more and more countries become sanctioned and they're learning from the Iran case that sanctions cannot easily be taken off. They, you know, they stick. And so then therefore there's an invested interest now to create and they, and, and they have already begun creating infrastructure that allows for trade to happen away from the U.S. dollar and, and the arms of, of, of um, yeah. Awesome. So ultimately, that may be the end of Washington's sanctions frenzy, because once de-dollarization goes very, very far, the utility of um, or, or even the punishing character of um, uh, financial sanctions will start to wither away. Yeah, I, I would say in addition to that is that, uh, as Nagy said, that that if uh, Russia, China, Iran, Cuba, Venezuela, et cetera, now rely on one another to basically absorb sanctions, then then actually the efficacy of sanctions goes down. So because because they now have strategic depth in one another. So the more you use sanctions uh, all over the place, the less effective your sanctions become because countries are not alone in this anymore. There is there is now ecosystem of sanctioned countries, some of them very large economies that basically produce uh, basically allow allow uh, one uh, each of those comp- uh, pieces to live to uh, live, live under sanctions so mm-hmm. russia was able to absorb the immediate shock to its middle class by the disappearance of consumer goods by turning to iran for varieties of consumer goods from you know uh, a, a parallel to pepsi to varieties of things that it already produces to basically uh, uh, provide uh, Russian middle class or Russian malls with, with goods that were disappearing. Um, but when you all saying that sanctions are sticky, are they sticky right away? Or is there, you know, perhaps the first couple of years phase in which if during that period something is done to amend the sanctions, one does not end up into the sticky trap of sanctions and as a result, um, U.S.-Russia relations may not go down the same uh, very negative, destructive path as U.S.-Iran uh, uh, relations have gone. And of course, it's not all about sanctions, but sanctions is a big part of it. Uh, how, how, what do you think about that, Valley? Well, I mean, if you listen to all the rhetoric we have about Russia, and if you were in Putin's shoes, you would say the only thing he's not hearing is a quid pro quo of sanctions, very specific sh- sanctions, being lifted and a guarantee that they won't return. So everything is being told to him about not doing certain things, leaving you know, Eastern Ukraine, agreeing to negotiations, whatever it is. But what he's being to- not being told is that the sanctions that were imposed on you are going to be lifted. So the assumption on the other side is that sanctions are permanent. Right, so if we don't behave in a way as if the sanctions get lifted, and I, and I and I want Nagas to sort of say because she's worked on this, is that this whole idea of vilifying countries immediately in order to put sanctions on, is also part of this. And Nagas, maybe you should say something about that. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, part of I think the answer to your question, Trita, is that sanctions require a uh, because it's not bombs dropping. So. So it requires an, an entire narrative shift or further shift if it's already under play to happen to make that country undesirable or to make that country a pariah, to make that country an enemy. So it's not just the political establishment, it's the because trade has to be blocked off. So it's about making uh, Russian society or Iranian society into a, a, an enemy and that's done discursively. Um, and so therefore it becomes really difficult, for example, to then have um, uh, the Hill representatives on on the Hill or in the Senate or the political class in general, or even in just within the media, begin to agree to, okay, sanctions should be lifted on Russia or on Iran or whatever. You can't even get to that level of the conversation because discursively, they are already so far from the pale. And so there has to be, in addition to sanctions coming off, there has to also be a shift in how you discuss these these societies. And that is a very difficult thing to do in a very polarized political atmosphere. Um, And one in which, and this is another part of the stickiness, is that these narratives are then built over decades of time. Mm, Very interesting. Um, We have a question from Stuart Kaplan. Uh, 
that goes to what you have discussed in terms of what is the intent of the sanctions. And, um, you know, he's asking whether, you know, the intent actually is to appease domestic constituencies in the United States, uh, show yourself tough, et cetera, uh, rather than necessarily changing behavior. I want to add a dimension to his question, which is that in the case of the United States and Iran, and I know your book is mostly focusing on the impact of the sanctions, but uh, in terms of the process over here, um, that you know the intent may actually have been very, very different from changing the behavior in specific ways. The first sanctions were uh, focusing more on Iranian support for terrorism, uh, opposition to the Middle East peace process, and the nuclear front. Uh, the two first ones have been more or less completely dropped from the from the narrative, and it's only been on the nuclear front. But some of the elements that have been pushing for it have perhaps also seen sanctions as a very useful tool for precisely what you just said, Narius. You are uh, vilifying and you're creating a pariah out of a state by having the sanctions. You need to have a degree of pariah narrative to start off, but then once you have sanctioned them, they're almost permanent in that block, which has certain geopolitical benefits for actors who've been pushing it. So going to the very first question we talked about, which is, you know, how do you measure whether it's been successful? You have to have a very clear idea of what the intent is. And, and should we really be assuming that the actual intent is the expressed intent? Uh, mindful of the fact that we don't tend to lift sanctions anyways, even when those expressed intents are met at times. Who wants to go first? Um, so this is not a part of the book, so I'm not going to attribute it to the book. This is sort of my own analysis that I'm doing separately, which is that sanctions are another form of U.S. forever war. Um, and and precisely because of this pushing into a pariah and then and sanctions solidifying conflict and not having any kind of, I mean, even Serbia, for example, that was sanctioned. Um, and then in the mid 1990s, there is a, a, a change in, 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 the, in the government's behavior and they're attempting to remove sanctions. And it's a very, very difficult process. So, you know, this is uh, something that solidifies conflict over decades. And um, this is part of the reason that the conclusion of the book is called Permanent Siege. Hmm. Vali, last word to you. I, I agree with her. And, and I, you know, in the case of Iran, uh, which might be different from other countries, there's also varieties of lobby groups, allies of the United States, as well as in, internal constituencies, which are which which have a say here. So their motivations from sanctions may be different from a particular administration, at a particular uh, point in the office. But but I do agree with uh, with Nargis that it does become a forever war. And then the reaction on the other side becomes uh, a forever war. And once you get on a track of forever war, it can actually become a, a forever war. Thank you so much, both to you, Vali, and to Nargis. This is a fantastic book, a fantastic contribution to a much needed conversation that needs to be heard much more in Washington than has been the case. And I am confident that it will have an impact over here. Before we leave, I want to uh, highlight uh, another webinar that we have next week that is very relevant to the very questions we just discussed here. Um, George Beebe and Anatol Lievin from Quincy Institute have a new report coming out on a diplomatic pathway for peace in Ukraine, which of course then touches on what needs to be done uh, with the sanctions as part of that equation. Uh, the event will be held on Wednesday, February 21st at 11 a.m. It's going to be a discussion about this report and the recommendations they're giving to the Biden administration on how to embark on a diplomatic strategy, which has been sorely missing for the last two weeks, uh, two years. For those of you who are subscribed to the Quincy newsletter, you will receive these updates from us. If you are not, please go to Quincy Inst. Dot org sign up for a newsletter so you will get automatic invitations to all of these different webinars events as well as our reports and other products that we are producing uh, with that thank you all so much for attending thank you again to uh, Nargis and Valley for an excellent conversation and I hope to see you all very soon thank you so much thank you thanks for inviting us